arguing, and I think it's right today. It has been this document that has enabled us this so diverse, broad land of ours, the most heterogeneous democracy in the history of the world, to do so many incredible things. For had you taken the cabin view of the Constitution from the outset, would we have been able to settle this vast continent from the Atlantic to the Pacific, mobilize millions of men and women to unite the nation and end slavery, fulfilling the promise of the Constitution? We ascend it like the mythical phoenix from the ashes of the Great Depression, we turned back despotism and preserved a free Europe in two world wars. We won the Cold War. We became the beacon of opportunity and innovation for the world. How could that have been done by 50 individual states without these uniting, overarching principles? No small achievement, these. All national in scope. So the question now is, in this period of great change, how do we apply these principles embodied in this civil Bible of ours to the challenges of the moment? Because they are no less consequential. As I said, the world has changed. It has changed utterly. We are contemplating things. I remember in a debate in 1978 when I was legitimately being questioned on my view of the Constitution. He said, it is clear, it is written, it is precise. I said, we are going to be debating before this is over questions that none of us will be able to answer in this debate, such as human cloning. I remember the local press when I said that, saying, what is this guy, crazy? We're on the cusp of some technological change. That election held tomorrow, asking the candidate every single solitary question within your scope of capability will not lend itself to the answers that will be needed by the time that man or woman's term is over. In my view, the highest achievement of the founders that they built a framework for government that allowed the many disparate voices to be heard, but then forced the disharmony through a funnel designed to drive toward compromise and consensus called the Constitution. The funnel is the Congress, and the Congress itself was the result of a compromise to the chagrin of some in Congress. It was called the Connecticut Compromise, in which states like Delaware, God love those founders, gave us two senators, Tommy, and California only two as well. <laughs> <laughs> so much for one man, one vote. <laughs> Tommy and I represent 32, California senator represents 32 people to every one we represent. It was called the Connecticut Compromise. States would be represented in proportion to their, not represented in proportion to their populations, except in the House. In the Senate, it would be equal representation based on numbers. The body in which I so proudly serve, the United States Senate, is at its core a counter majoritarian institution, as is the Constitution. That is where the harmony and disharmony lies in the Constitution. It is a counter majoritarian majoritarian document. It does not say if the majority want to do A, B, or C, then the majority will rule. It says there are certain things because we understand human nature. We are keen observers of human nature. There are certain things that are not justified under any circumstance because they were a product of a history. Where majorities were tyrannies. There were minorities equally as tyrannical. It was designed to promote, the Senate was designed to promote the cooling of the passions and the resolution of disagreements. Jefferson wasn't here when the Constitution was written. 
He came back from France. And you all know, but sometimes we have to remind ourselves, we were a nation for 13 years before the Constitution was even written. Everybody showed up in Philly with an agreement that they would not change the Articles of Confederation. They met in the middle of July on the second floor where the heat rises. So the public could not overhear their debates. Remember that, Joe, when you're commenting on American politics. <laughs> and what did they produce? Think of the wisdom and the judgment that was assembled in that room for that period. I will not quote which I was going to French philosophers and English Enlightenment period that figures about the breadth and depth and knowledge, the educational achievement of these men who sat in that room. It was all about knowing human nature. Madison called the Senate a necessary fence, continuing his quote, against the fickleness, against fickleness and passion tended to influence the attitudes of the general public and members of the House of Representatives. Just how high and impenetrable that fence was designed to be has also been debated and abused and tested from the very outset. In 1790, Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton proposed that Congress charter a national bank a debate which began to set the contours of the real power of the federal government relative to the states, and a debate which resurfaces, resurfaced in every generation in some form or another. Hamilton, the Federalist, was the one arguing that it would put our young nation on the path of fiscal stability and prosperity in the wake of all the debt that had been written off during the Revolutionary War. Immediately, the idea generated heated debate in Congress and within the President's own cabinet. Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson said that by chartering the bank, the federal government will, quote, take possession of a boundless field of power, no longer susceptible to any definition. In response, Hamilton complained that certain descriptions of men are getting out of, uh, of men for getting out of debt, yet are against all taxes for raising money to pay for that debt. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> Does that debate sound familiar to you as they say down home to y'all? <laughs> the passionate philosophic debate that ensued led opponents to accuse each other of trying to literally destroy the country. Remember, I'm talking about 1790, not 2011. President Washington was subjected to vicious attacks because he sided with Hamilton. But here's why I think he was probably the greatest president we ever had, not because of his skills as a great general. He had more wisdom than the vast majority of our presidents. And here's what he said. He said, while some partisan conflict was inevitable, it must not rise to the level where men who oppose the government in all measures are determined by clogging its wheels indirectly to change the nature of it and in the process subvert the Constitution. Does that sound familiar to today? Literally, not figuratively. The leaders learn and leaders grow, and that's what I cherish so much in the Senate. Despite being opposed to the National Bank in 1790, President James Madison, two decades later, asked the Congress to recharter the bank because he knew it was the only means to combat inflation, a problem caused by debts incurred in the War of 1812, a national war with national responsibilities. The contours of this debate were reset by the Civil War. It laid down a marker that had not existed.